This is a rather large speaker. And I'd say the most appropriate way to drive it would be with a Class T amplifier, since Class A and Class B amplifiers are a bit too inefficient. And what better way to learn about Class D amplifiers than to make a completely discrete version of your own? And by completely discrete, I mean only using transistors, capacitors, and the other basic components. So without further ado, let's dive in and make the circuit. Let's first begin with how exactly a Class D amplifier works and why it's so efficient. To do that, let's briefly take a look at Class A and Class B amplifiers to see their shortcomings. Class A amplifiers have the best output quality, but that comes with the worst efficiency of the bunch. The poor efficiency comes from the singular transistor, which is always on and active, even if there is no input signal. Class B does a bit better in terms of efficiency by using two transistors to drive either side of the load. However, the output is still mostly linear, and the transistors will burn off the excess power before it reaches the load. Class D is different in that it does not have a linear output. Instead, it uses a switching topology to achieve the end result. It's efficient in the same way that a switching power supply is more efficient than a linear one. There is no power burn off but rather, the output of the transistors are either fully on or fully off. Here is a top-down view on how a Class D amplifier works. First, we have our input signal, which we plan on amplifying. Then, we pass it into a PWM modulator of some sort. Usually, this is in the form of a comparator, which compares the audio signal with a much faster triangle wave. The output from this is, of course, a PWM signal. The amplitude of the original signal is preserved in the duty cycle of the PWM. The longer the signal is on, the larger the amplitude of the signal. Then we take this signal and we pass it into our output stage. Normally this output is driven by two MOSFETs, so you will need some sort of MOSFET driver. When the PWM signal is high, then the high side MOSFET is on, and when the signal is low, the low side MOSFET is on. This is where the efficiency comes from. Since there is very little power lost in the FETs due to them either being fully on or fully off. And finally, we take the amplified PWM signal from the MOSFETs and pass it into a low pass filter to retrieve our amplified audio signal. Depending on the complexity of your design, you may or may not have negative feedback, but a little bit more on that later. Let's start off with the MOSFET driver. In normal cases, you'd purchase a MOSFET driver IC to handle all of this for us. But we are taking on the challenge of making one ourselves. So basically, here's what needs to happen. We need to alternate which MOSFET is on based on the input PWM signal. A 1 should turn on the top MOSFET, and a 0 should turn on the bottom MOSFET. It sounds simple at first, because it kind of is. All that we have to do is to invert the logic signal to one of the MOSFETs. Let's take a look at one such circuit that can do this for us. Here is an AND circuit using RTL logic. Why use an AND gate and not just a buffer or an inverter? Well, I'll show you in a second. Anyways, you'll see that this AND gate has two inputs followed by a common emitter amplifier. This second transistor is needed since the first two invert the signal. So this just inverts it again to regain the intended signal. The final stage is this push-pull amplifier using a PNP and NPN transistor. This is used to quickly overcome the gate source capacitance and switch the MOSFET much more quickly. If we had used this stage before, the resistor would have been a very slow driver. So if we give a constant 1 to one of the inputs and a PWM signal to the other, we can measure the switching speed of the gate. Here's how the driver looks with a 10 kHz square wave applied to it. It looks okay from here. But let's zoom in. You will notice that there is quite the delay before the gate even starts changing. It's even worse if we take a look at the falling edge. What causes these differences and why is it so slow? Well, it comes down to a few things. First, RTL uses resistors to drive everything. Depending on the resistor, this can slow things down. RTL also ends up putting the BJTs into deep saturation when turning on the transistors. This makes it much harder to turn off the transistor, which is why there is such a long delay on the falling edge. We can fix some of these problems by switching to a different logic type, TTL. 
Here's what our new AND gate looks like. I already know what some of you are thinking. That input transistor looks mighty confusing. Well, let me explain. Let's take a look at the diode model of the NPN transistor. When we have ones at the inputs, the current flows from the base to the collectors, since this is the only path to ground. This will drive the next transistor, and we will end up with a one on the output. Now, if there's even one zero on one of the inputs, then all of the current will be diverted to it, since there is only one diode drop over here. It will take all of the current and nothing will flow into the following transistor. This will give us a zero on the output. If you look online, you'll find that most circuits have this totem pole output. My circuit here uses a push pole output. I use this instead because it will give us an easier time driving the MOSFET, like I said earlier. Anyways, this new setup is much faster than the old RTL setup. So let's measure it. As you can see, the rising edge is much faster than before. The output basically rises with the edge. The falling edge still has a delay, but it is greatly improved and much more brief. It looks all right for being placed in a 400 kHz POW in cycle two. Now, let's build up the other side so we can get a feel for the push-pull nature of the output MOSFETs. To invert the PWM signal for the second driver, we can add another two transistors in an inverting pattern. When we have a one on the PWM signal, it will pull the transistor down, thus pulling the input of the AND gate down to a zero. Anyways, it all works as expected, and we get an inverted square wave on each gate. However, you may notice that there's some crossover between the signals periods of time where they are both active at the same time. Ideally, we should separate them out just enough so that they are never on at the same time. We call this period where they are both off dead time. And that's why I went through all the effort of making an AND gate, because we're going to use a dead time signal. That's what the DT signal stands for anyways. I've set up our circuit so far such that we can pulse a low signal on the dead time input to disable the MOSFET output. So all we have to do is generate this low pulse. We should generate this pulse on the rising and falling edges of the PWM signal. But how will we detect the edges? Well, let's take a look at our friend, the capacitor. By looking at its equation, we can see that it is differential by nature. We can use this to our advantage and create a differentiator. Imagine what would happen if we differentiated our PWM signal. Well, on the flat edges, we'd get zero volts, and on the high edges, we'd get steep voltage spikes. So, how do we create such a differentiator? Well, we first create a high pass filter. And yes, a high pass filter is the same thing as a differentiator. We can use this technique to detect our rising edges, since the output of a differentiator is a positive spike. Simply attach an NPN transistor to detect the spike and pull the output low. But what about the falling edge? We get a massive negative spike instead. So how do we deal with that? Well, if you move the resistor up to VCC instead and attach a PNP transistor, now when we get the negative spike, the PNP will sink current through the base and turn on the transistor. We will add another NPN transistor to invert the signal so we can pull the output low on the falling edge. If we combine the two outputs, we will then get a comprehensive edge detector, which will serve as our dead time driver. Let's take a look at our gate voltages now. And as you can see, they are sufficiently separated, and neither overlaps the other. Now that we have our MOSFET driver, we need a PWM signal to actually drive it. Like I said earlier, the PWM modulator is commonly created in the form of a comparator. To test that our circuit is working so far, I'll temporarily use this LM311 as our comparator. It gives us this nice NPN output, which we can use to pull down any signal. I simply put this into a TTL inverter because I needed it to also drive the high side of its output. I used a totem pull output this time instead because it actually reaches down to zero volts, unlike the push-pull driver from before. Anyways, with this, it's time for the first official test. On the inverting input of the comparator, I placed a 400 kHz triangle wave. On the non-inverting input, I placed a much slower sine wave. This sine wave is in the audible range, so that we can actually hear it. And it works, although with some distortion. This is because we still have shoot-through. 
the dead time is working correctly, but there are some timing differences between the high and low side due to there being an imbalance in the number of transistors. So to fix things, I added two more transistors and a capacitor to the PWM input on the high side to balance things out. I then placed an LC low pass filter and a speaker for testing. And wow, it sounds surprisingly good. But the goal is to make a design using only transistors. So the LM311 has to go. In its place, I put a discrete comparator. If you've read the LM393 datasheet, you might recognize this schematic because it's the same thing. If you're curious how this discrete version of the LM393 works, well, note how it looks a lot like the DIY off map I made in the other video. This time though, it's optimized for switching speed. You can still see the differential pair. This time is implemented with PNP transistors. At the top and bottom, you'll find the current mirrors as well. The main difference is the Darlington input stage, which allows a faster response time in the circuit. And when we integrate it into our design, it sounds just as good as the Elm 311. So I'd say that we didn't lose any performance here by going discrete. So far, for the comparator, we've been using a function generator to create the triangle wave, but this won't be allowed in the final design. So we need to find a way to generate the triangle wave inside of the circuit. One such way of doing this is by integrating a square wave. So let's start with the integrator. We have two options, an active integrator or a passive one. A passive integrator has the advantage of being used with a small number of components, just two capacitor and a resistor. An active integrator, on the other hand, also involves an entire op-amp, but it comes with the advantage of being more stable and able to drive a small load. So we have to wait whether building an entire op-amp is worth it here. I started the experiment with the passive integrator, a 2K2 resistor and a 1 nanofarad capacitor. And after feeding in a 400 kilohertz square wave, we do indeed see the approximate triangle wave on the output. However, the amplitude of it is rather small, and it will make it difficult to work with on its own. Not to mention the effect that the comparator will have on it. But it really isn't good enough. So I decided that it was just best to go ahead and build an active integrator using a discrete op-amp. Following the active integrator, we have an op-amp-based Schmidt trigger. This will give us a square wave, which our integrator will turn into a triangle. The triangle then feeds back into the Schmidt trigger which, again, in result, creates our square wave. And as we can see, we get our triangle wave on the output of the integrator, which we can use. We aren't done yet, though. We should feed the triangle wave into an op-amp amplifier in order to act as both a buffer and to change the amplitude as needed before it enters the comparator. We should make another amplifier to amplify the audio signal from our player. We can use this amplifier to adjust for volume. Now it's just time to test our prototype. And at first, I tried using this little speaker. But it didn't sound great. I then upgraded to this bigger speaker. And it was sort of working at this point. But there were still a few issues. The output was very quiet. And after some probing around, I found the issue. I'm sure several of you watching have already noticed, but I forgot to put bootstrapping in on the high side MOSFET driver. Now, N channel MOSFETs need a positive voltage between the gate and the source in order to turn on. The problem here is that the high side MOSFET wasn't referenced to ground. So we were having issues creating a large enough voltage difference on VGS. This is the problem that bootstrapping addresses. Basically, we can charge up a capacitor to VCC when the drain is connected to ground through the low side MOSFET. This capacitor will retain the same voltage drop even after the low side switch closes. Then when we want to turn on the high side MOSFET, we can use this capacitor as our voltage difference. This will mean that the gate will be the capacitor's voltage higher than the source, which will completely turn on the MOSFET. And with this change, the circuit now works very well. And the test was very impressive. I played a nice rock song, which I unfortunately can't play for you since it would infringe on copyright. But here's a royalty free song that you can listen to. Ah! 
I'm not sure how well it comes across in the video, but in real life, this thing got extremely loud. And it's honestly better than I was expecting. The only issue here really was the quality of the output, but that's to be expected when making a breadboard circuit. I figured the next step was to make a PCB version of the circuit on the breadboard. The only change that I made from the original was that I added a feedback system. This feedback circuit is not original though. I copied it from a paper made by Charles Lehman. I've linked it in the description below in case you'd like to read it. However, I unfortunately wasn't able to really test it properly, as you'll see in a moment. Desoldering for this board took a long time, due to the sheer number of components. I had to probe each transistor individually to ensure that there weren't any shorts. I do have to say though, that the final result does look very pleasing. Getting it to work on the other hand, was the very opposite. The first issue was that the triangle generator wasn't working. So I went through and found that two of the transistors weren't properly matched. No big deal, I simply replaced them, then it went back to normal. Then another transistor was drawing too much current, so I had to replace that one. I could keep going on about the issues, but basically the list of issues seemed endless. And it really didn't help that the triangle generator kept breaking after a few minutes of use. I would go fix it and go about testing another part. Then the triangle generator would break itself again. I did manage to get everything working for a brief moment, but the result was less than impressive. I wish that I could have been more successful with this project, but it was taking up so much time and I wanted to focus on other videos. At least the breadboard version got good results. I'm also sure that you can massively reduce the number of transistors used. Either way, this made for a really interesting experiment, and I learned a lot about Class D amplifiers along the way. Feel free to leave any improvements or suggestions in the comments below. Anyways, thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed, please consider subscribing so that you can see my future videos. Also, visit my Buy Me A Coffee page. With your support, I can keep making videos like this one. I would like to thank Mr. Deb Knoll and Cognizant for being longtime channel supporters. You both have helped me create this video specifically. Anyways, thanks for watching. Have a good one.